Okay, great. So there are four directions that the people can pursue. One is quantum error correction, quantum control. And another one, which is actually very interesting, especially from the physics point of view, is which is not at all new, it's topological quantum computing. And of course, material science, in, in, because I mean, these objects that we build uh, can be get better. Okay, so we, fabrication techniques, using new, new materials, um, these, all these uh, four efforts can actually push this, uh, this uh, quantum computing uh, direction. Now, I will basically talk about quant topological quantum computing to some extent. As a brief outlook, we will talk about bi-periodic Josephson junction, what they are, what does it mean, how can we get them? And so, and through them, we will uh, basically uh, have um, construct parity protected superconducting qubits, uh, what are, how they work, what, what's the advantage, all these kind of things. And then uh, we will couple them to a Majorana qubit and to, in order to perform a swap gate. And then I will show you how we can employ bi-periodic Josephson junction in superconducting circuit to do kind of band engineering and enhance the coherence of the system. Okay, so just one very, very, very simple slide. So we have just on junction and drive reflection, we have a normal uh, conductor, we have a superconductor at the interface, electron bounce against the superconductor and they are reflect reflected as a whole because, of, uh, because a Cooper pair is absorbed in a superconductor. Right now, the retro reflection, if I put another superconductor, it works in this way, which it is immediately clear that the bound state will form there. So an electron is retro reflected as a whole, which is retro reflected as an electron following the very same path. So this gives rise immediately to a bound state. We can describe this bound state through scattering theory at the non-interacting level with a semiconductor model of a superconductor. And then we can describe these bound states as a let's say they come up from scattering theory and uh, the energy dependence, let's say in absence of an applied external magnetic field is directly related by this phase factor, which is nothing more than another way of encoding the coherence factor of the Bogolubov of the Jan equation. Now, all these is pretty general, pretty general, but we can make it the, the case in which this transverse direction is very, very small. We have just one channel, the simplest case possible, and then what you end up is that an Andreev bound state forms with this shape, okay? So the energy, we have two levels because we are in a semiconductor model of a superconductor. We are just another way of describing the excitation of the system. Delta is the gap, the superconducting gap. T is the transmission probability to this normal area. And phi is the phase difference, the gauge invariant one between the two superconductors. Okay, so... Uh, let's study a little bit how this uh, function works as a function of T, the transmission probability that goes from zero, completely quenched uh, channel that is uh, cut the wire basically, to one completely transparent. Now, typically in a Josephson junction, what we have that we work in a regime in which the normal region is actually not normal, but it's insulating. So just typically a single Cooper pair can tunnel. In this case, T is much smaller than one, and then we can expand this, uh, this expression. And what we find is the typical Josephson energy, which is proportional to the cos phi, okay? The cosine of the phase difference. However, if we just play a little bit with T and we plot this function uh, for different T, we see that, I mean, the higher is T, the higher is the non-anharmonicity of, uh, of this function. So it means that uh, if we take this object and then we basically fully transform it, we can write this as a series of uh, harmonics, cosine of, of n phi. What does this n phi mean? It basically means that not only can one Cooper pair traverse the, the area and uh, uh, basically tunnel from one superconductor to another, but we can also have two Cooper pairs, three Cooper pairs, n Cooper pairs. This is simply because uh, the higher is T, you see, every time that you have a bound state, you have an electron, that, which is Andrea reflected, there is one Cooper pair that goes. Another Andrea reflection, another Cooper pair that goes. So the more you have, the more you have probability to, to transfer multiple Cooper pair at the same time. And uh, so for high T, for T very close to one, we can have uh, um, basically multiple Cooper pair. Now, 
let's let's see what happens if these uh, this t is perfectly equal to one. By this formula, you immediately see that you have two branches that cross but do not split. They do not couple. And so if you if you check, you have immediately a pi periodic Josephson effect because uh, if you take this line, you end up here, but you have to go all the way to four pi to recover the full periodicity. This is pretty general of a t equal one channel. And a particular way to build up a t equal one channel is to, to build a Josephson junction between two topological superconductors. I will be very brief about that. I will skip all the details about how you find uh, what are topological superconductor, how do you find Majorana fermions and things like that. But as a matter of fact, I just want to mention that you will Im immediately find uh, uh, Majorana fermions that hybridize here at the junction and then will give rise to such a four pi periodic Josephson effect, right? And now, of course, the, the, there will be an energy associated to it. That is the, the bound state, but also gamma one and gamma one prime, such as gamma two and gamma two prime can hybridize because they, they are close enough, let's say on a distance order of the coherence length of the hosting superconductor. And so this is basically what we have uh, if you have a general a topological superconductor and, uh, and the kind of uh, Andre bound state that you, that you, that you see. Right, so how can we cook up a pi periodic Josephson effect? We just said that with the Majorana, you have a four pi periodic Josephson effect. Can we get a pi periodic Josephson effect? Of course. So what we do, we want to have basically a cost to phi. That's the idea, okay? So, but as I showed you before, what you have is that you have several harmonics of this, uh, of this functional form, but these harmonics, they have a weight, okay? And the weight is exponentially suppressed with n. N is the then harmonic uh, order. So what you do is you take two superconductors and then you place two of these wires, nano wires that have these, uh, this dispersion, that, uh, this uh, under bound state with high harmonic content that I showed before. Now, suppose that again, you have two equal of them. They, they are in principle, especially physically different because there will be different wires. You have different, uh, thickness, degree of disorder, many things like that, okay? But at the theory level, we can always imagine that we place two equal of such wires. And what happens is that if you, if you just insert alpha flux quantum between the two, so one of the two gauge invariant phase is totally uh, determined by the other one, by the quantization of the, of the superconducting phase around this loop. And so what you end up is that uh, is a simple pi periodic expression, okay? And uh, it describes basically at the lowest order a uh, tunneling of four electrons or better two Cooper pairs. This has been realized in the group of Copenhagen. Uh, exactly, you see now, these are the two little wires that mimic this. And this is a little area that would be that one pierced by, through a magnetic field and these, which is actually this one, is the superconducting island of what I'm just gonna talk about now. So, but, so this is possible. So this is current physics ongoing. It's just not, uh, of course, they, they have a little side gate here and here, so they can tune the probability through, the, through these wires in a way to get as much as, as close as possible to this equality between the two which is a requirement to get a pi periodic uh, element. All right, so there are, this, is, these are, this is not the, the only way to do that, actually is the most re recent one. The first one was uh, put forward by Johnny Blatter uh, 20 years ago, basically. So instead of having, so I suppose that you have a, a superconducting quantum interference device, a squid is just a loop interrupted by two Josephson junction. And if the Josephson junction are equal, you know that if you put alpha flux quantum through it, you completely kill the current through the, through the device. Now, if you put four, what happens is that you have these two islands, right? Or let's say, let's put it another way. You have several degrees of freedom that are just the, 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 phase, uh, the phase differences across the several junction, which are three independent because uh, in a loop, you can always fix one and then you get n minus one independent. Uh, and then what happens is that if you basically go to the ground state of this object 
And then what you find is that it's a kind of, uh, it has more harmonics than the, 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 the fundamental one. So again, if you just insert half-flux quantum, you will kill the first harmonic and all the second and third and fourth harmonic. In principle, if you have a perfectly symmetric object, whenever you put half-flux quantum, you kill all the odd harmonics. So you get at least close to phi with good extent. But there are other, other proposals to do that, employing uh, uh, inductors and uh, a Jesus injunction, and then employing superinductors, chains of this rhombi, and uh, current mirror proposed by Kitev, and PISA is all on the table, and then it's pretty old and new. At the same time, there, there's been a lot of research effort to, to obtain these things. Uh, at, the, uh, at the experimental level. And then all the success is, is something that is recent, a few years ago. All right, so let's make a qubit out of this. But before that, let's quickly, quickly, very quickly remind how does a, a superconducting qubit work for those of you that don't know. So suppose that you have just a Josephson junction that separates a superconducting island from a, another bulk superconductor, which plays the role of a reference, and then that you can kind of tune a little bit the, the offset charge through a gate capacitance that will provide a, an offset charge on this superconducting diode. Now, if you write the Hamiltonian, you will have two terms. One is the charging energy, and one is the Josephson energy. Now, the charging energy basically counts how many how much charge you have that differs from a multiple of 2e, because this uh, n is, uh, is a charge in units of 2e, I should have written. And this uh, Josephson energy is the energy that you gain or lose by a tunneling of Cooper pairs uh, at the junction itself. So suppose that you have, uh, in a, you have uh, the dominance of the charging energy. So if you just put Ej to zero, at every n, you have parabolas. Okay, you have several parabolas as a function of ng, and then you switch off a little bit of this ej, and then very little tiny gaps open here, and then what's called the qubit is just this two-level system here. Now, of course, you can increase the ratio EG, ej over ec, and then you can go to an intermediate situation in which you see that now you have a much stronger uh, um, level difference, energy difference between the first two levels, and then you still uh, recover the the old parabola at higher energy. And then if you go in the very transmode regime, which is EJ over AC 50, 70, 100, something like that, then you basically almost have almost an almost harmonic uh, uh, ladder of levels. It is important that it is not harmonic, otherwise you couldn't just address the first two, but the anharmonicity is weak. But as a, the, the good point is that you have lost all this dependence of, of these uh, offset charge. We will see later on why, I hope I have time, um, why this is actually important. Okay, now we do the same with the cos to phi, okay? So it's important to, to have a look at what actually means uh, this Cooper pair tunneling. So you can write this e to the i phi as an operator. Uh, phi and n are conjugate variables, so you can, uh, in, in a in a variable, in a representation in which phi is defined, so let's say space, n would be minus i derivative with respect to phi. But in a representation in which n is diagonal, then the e to the i phi is this kind of rising operator. All right, so it increases the number of Cooper pairs by one. So what happens is that I, if I apply this kind of uh, description, uh, meaning basically the charge basis, I see that, of course, this term is diagonal, and this term only couples n to n plus two. So it means that if I start with n even, I will always be in the subspace in which n is even. If I start with n odd, I will always be in, this, in the subspace in, in which n is odd, which is not what was happening before, because if I put n plus one here, I change every time subspace, every time that the AC, a Cooper pair tunnels at the junction. So as a, as a matter of fact, there is a perfect uh, uh, separation of the Hilbert space, basically, in two sectors um, of uh, different uh, parity of the number of Cooper pairs in the junction. All right, so we are got that these two subspaces are orthogonal, 
And actually, in, uh, for EC that goes to zero, they become even degenerate, All right? Let's see the spectrum. This is uh, the two uh, cases that I showed before, the very transmore regime, what you, and the, the charge box, actually, this is the intermediate regime. EJ is 10 times larger than EC. Let's start from these. So you see that these, uh, you still see parabolas as we, we, we saw before. But so let's say that this parabola, there is this one that you see with the plus, it means you are in the even space. And then uh, pay attention to the periodicity. So, n gate, the, the gate, uh, the charge on the on the gate is uh, goes from zero to four, okay? Because uh, if you have only even, so suppose that uh, you have you take just the, the even spectrum, then you have periodicity of two Cooper pairs charge for e, and then you have two sectors that differ by one Cooper pair. And so these two sets of uh, uh, eigenvalues are shifted one respect to another by one Cooper pair. All right, and then if you see the eigenfunctions of these levels, you will see that the ground state has only even numbers of Cooper pair. The first excited state has only odd, only odd. The, uh, the second only even, the third, and so, and so on. So that's exactly what I what I said before, that you have uh, uh, even and odd uh, parity of the number of Cooper pairs. If I crank up E J over E C then I go in what's the, the transmore regime. Now here, the picture is a bit different. So it's the same, it's the same because it's just the, the numbers that are different, but the physical picture, it's better seen in another basis, which is the basis in which phi, the phi variable is a good quantum number. And so if I had the cos phi, there is a periodicity, which is intrinsic, which is two pi, the phase is the compact variable, pi, a phase that differs, Two phases that difference by two pi are equivalent. So I would have just one minimum. But if the phase difference um, is, uh, the, I mean, sorry, the energy phase relation is cos two phi, I have two inequivalent minima at zero and pi. And so suppose that, uh, I mean, if Ej is very big, it means that this barrier is very high. Okay, so I can, in first approximation, I can forget about this barrier, this other wall. And then I, I, I can quantize uh, the, the levels here, and I have like a set of harmonic oscillator states corrected with a little harmonicity that still comes from the cosine potential. Now I can do this, this on, on both sides. And if EC goes to zero, it means that this barrier is infinite. And so you have perfect degeneracy between levels in one well and the, in another well. And so for example, what were these, Four states have become have coalesced in two states, each of them, which is doubly degenerate. But of course, if I increase a little bit EC, I reduce a little bit the, 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 the barrier, I can tunnel from here to here. And the, the tunneling involves a phase leap process, which is exponentially suppressed in square root of EJ over EC. So the larger is EJ over EC, the, the smaller is the is the splitting. Okay, so this is the spectrum of a superconducting uh, qubit uh, parity protected because why? Because these two sub subspaces are completely uncoupled if there are no two pi periodic perturbation. Okay, and the same, the degeneracy here or the splitting that can arise here is still protected. Okay, so we have a, a qubit that is protected. In which sense? It, it means that uh, if I am able to, to kill every two pi periodic perturbation, suppose that I am, then is very, and then I want to encode information in the first lowest energy states, it means that the environment has very tough life to, to, to make the, 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 the qubit unstable, to make the qubit faulty, which means relaxation time are very long, coherence times are very long. So this is very promising from the quantum computing purposes. In the previous case, the one that I showed you before, there is nothing like that. So the transmon is faulty. And we will see why the transmon is faulty. Uh, and so now I have a very good object. I can still couple it by a microwave radiation. I can excite. I can do uh, single qubit rotation. I can couple two of them. I can do two qubit uh, gates. I can do quantum computing. And there would be exactly just one thing, right? 
one thing that would be missing. Okay, so suppose that we have a Majorana qubit. Now, I don't know why I see up and down these things, but okay. Uh, suppose that we have a Majorana qubit, which is another way of uh, encoding a qubit. You just need two quantum states to have a qubit. It doesn't matter where they come from. So suppose that we have uh, a Majorana qubit. What is a Majorana qubit? Let's have four Majorana uh, bound state, zero energy bound state. Out of these, I can create two fermions. And with these two fermions, I can create in general four states. These four states are just counted by the, the, the charge that is, uh, or the number of fermions that is uh, encoded um, in these states. Now, I cannot violate the number uh, of fermions. Okay, so I, can, I have to choose. So I have to choose one of these two parity sectors. And now I just wanna say it now, there will be a parity associated to the superconducting qubit, what I talked before about the number of Cooper pairs. This we will call bosonic parity. And there is the parity associated to the number of fermions which are uh, occupying the states, this is Majorana qubit, and we will call it fermionic parity. Okay, so uh, I have to choose one of these. I can, yes, oh no, sorry. Uh, I am, we, we can choose one of these two parity sectors and in these two parity sectors, I have two states. So I can encode the, uh, encode the qubit. And the good things, I don't want to go through this. There are 10 years, I think, of uh, literature that have pushed the way of uh, why a Majorana qubit is, uh, is a good thing. And basically, it's uh, due to the topological protection uh, that, that is due to the fact that these uh, excitations, these Majorana fermions are very far apart and that they cannot be coupled by a local perturbation. And since nature and environment typically acts through local perturbation, this is a very, very good example of uh, an object that is very re resilient to the environment. All right. But what's the idea now? I have a parity protected superconducting qubit. I have long coherence times because it, it is parity protected. I can drive it through microwave because it couples to a transmission line resonator via its charge on the, on the superconducting island. I can have relatively fast gates. The, of course, the, the more is protected, the, the slower is the gate. It's always a trade-off. But on the other hand, I have a Majorana qubit, which is very protected, topologically, ideally protected in principle, but it's very hard to access. I cannot do really real computation with this object. And what's ideal for? For a quantum memory. Okay, so the idea is now let's take a parity protected superconducting qubit, do all our quantum processing with this, and at the end of the day, we swap our information onto the Majorana qubit that we will use for storage. That's the basic idea. We got there, but yeah, it's kind of uh, not exact, not an ideal system, but at least it's something. What we need is a swap gate. So it's important to find a way to couple these two objects such that you get a swap gate. If you don't get a swap gate, then it's useless, basically. Okay, how do we do? We start with a superconducting island. We place another superconductor, which is much bigger and plays the role of a reference, All right? Then we put one of these very narrow semiconducting wires and we put another one. They will be different. In what way? We make one of the two to be a topology, to host four Majorana fermions. Now in this picture, it's not very clear how we can do that, but you could do, imagine that you deform the system, the, uh, the, the, the superconducting uh, reference, it has a shape, L shape, and the, these two you can make orthogonal, and then you drive with an in-plane magnetic field, one of them in a topological phase and the other not, for example, or do the magic. Let's have one wire with four uh, Majorana uh, zero energy modes and one with not, okay? And then, we place Alflux quantum through it. And we hope that these two wires have equal uh, transmission through the, okay, there are a lot of if, but if, then we can couple it through a, through inside the gate to a um, transmission line resonator. We can tune the, um, all this has been realized. So, I mean, that's, that's, gonna be the, that's gonna be the setup. So let's see whether it works and how it works. So, uh, now this wire 
in addition to the, 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 the several modes, pretty anharmonic, anharmonic that I showed you before, is also the mode associated to the two Majorana fermions that hybridize at the junction, all right? And so the full Hamiltonian is gonna be the Hamiltonian of the parity protected qubit with the cos to phi, simplified here, but of course you have all these and they have content. Uh, and then you have the four state for hybridization by at nearest neighbor that you have here, which is a uh, intra uh, segment, wire segment and inter uh, Joseph's injunction. Okay, again, I have two parity sectors. Now the charge states that are pretty general for any four Majorana fermions that you, you may have are associated to one electron being here and another electron be uh, on the other side. One on the superconducting island, one on the superconducting reference. We can choose one of them. Let's say that from, for, as a matter of fact, we now fix to P equal one. Okay, let me speed up a little bit. Now the presence of the Majorana zero energy mode is actually further hidden in the boundary condition of the wave function. And this is a very, very subtle point, but that's, that's all what's inside uh, Majorana qubit. Because uh, phi is the conjugate to the number. And if number counts Cooper pair, uh, if a, a slippage of the phase by two pi describes a transition of one Cooper pair. And so if you have an additional electron here, okay, so you slip of half Cooper pair, okay? It means that in a phase you slip by four pi. Okay, I just wanted to say this. It's a bit, it's a bit involved that uh, this is what we have, and we can get rid of it through a unitary transformation and then um, work with the simple periodic uh, wave function. And then uh, what you find is that in this, suppose that this zero zero sector, one one sector of the Majorana qubit, and uh, in this case, you see that the charge, the offset charge is shifted by one electron because in that state you have one electron more. And, uh, and off diagonally, you have couplings due to the cos phi over two, four pi just as an effect. And then uh, I just put this little uh, scheme of levels to see the lowest, two lowest level and the highest lowest level, higher lowest level in case you don't have Majorana fermions, what I showed you before. And now let's focus just on this very low energy sector. And then now I expect four states. And uh, this is what we have. If we have, let's say, EM equals zero, they don't talk to each other at the barrier and they don't talk to each other through the, through the superconductor. So basically the Majorana uh, Hamiltonian is zero. There is none. And so you have, what you have here is two cosine and minus cosine if you want. And then you have um, the same shifted, okay, by one electron, okay, which means uh, 0 0.5 in this unit, okay. And so you have two, these four states are all orthogonal. They don't talk to each other. And these are the four states associated to two states of the Majorana qubit and two state, states of the parity protected qubit. Now let's play a little bit. What we do, we can do, I haven't put it here, sorry, there should be a plus lambda and minus lambda above here. So we increase basically the decrease, sorry, the distance between the, the two Majorana and we let them couple, okay? This can be done also by tuning the in-plane magnetic field and exploiting the oscillation of the Majorana fermions, but I don't wanna go into these details. What you basically have is that the cosine cure shift down in energy, the sine cure shift up in energy. It's pretty clear here how it works. And uh, let's uh, instead just turn on just uh, EM. And from this, uh, this plot, you go just down and then you see that you open here and here you open gaps. Now it is not really visible, but these are not actually protected, these crossings. So there are, you have a little, little bit of crossing goes there. And now we crank up everything. And then you have, uh, let's say, uh, you have the hybridization of every Majorana. And then, so basically you see that here you have slightly of hybridization. But what we are concerned that was most important here is this one, because what we want to talk and we, we want to couple is suppose that we want to couple this guy to this guy. Okay, I haven't put it here, but to make a swap gate, 
you need to couple, let's say, spin up down with the down up in this language. And so you can choose whatever you like as a spin up and spin down. In this case, you just need at least one of these crossings to open. And in this case, the relevant crossing is this one. I don't want to go into details of this. Actually, I'm very late. And uh, this can be seen in the microwave spectrum, where you see that this is the point in which you basically see the pay attention to the to the periodicity that the spectrum becomes now to be periodic because of the of the Maya, the presence of the Majorana qubit. But this light here it means that there is a, a pretty large splitting and the coupling between these two systems. Now, if you want to see the entire power uh, microwave spectrum, you see that in absence of uh, Majorana qubit and pi periodic perturbation, two pi periodic perturbation, a pure cos to phi uh, potential will give rise to this kind of, uh, of a microwave spectrum. So there are a lot of transition that you don't see. Okay. And so if you switch on a little bit of two pi periodic transition uh, perturbation, you can switch on some of them. And that's what you find if you just have two pi periodic transition. And uh, Whereas instead, if you have a major on a cube, things are pretty different. So you can see that there is a difference. You can also use this to, to see that, in fact, there is something more than just two pi periodic transition in the spectrum of this object. OK, so let me finish the first part of this uh, presentation. And with just uh, a, a little uh, uh, summary, uh, I show you how uh, Josephson junction with high harmonic content can be engineer and uh, to perform to to obtain pi periodic Josephson junction and the, how these uh, in fact conserve the parity of the number of Cooper pairs on the superconducting islands they make it uh, they join and how you can cook up and build up a parity protected superconducting qubit and insert the Majorana qubit in it that can be used as a topological uh, topologically protected memory once you find a, a, a way to make, uh, to perform a swap game. Any question at this level? Yes. Can you? Ah. Can, can you remove slightly the, the mask? Uh, I, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, maybe it's a naive question, but in, on some slide you have had an intercommutation relation for Majorana fermions. Yeah. Could you please say some words because I'm a bit confused with this. Yeah, I mean, uh, so if I... The fact that is I, I wrote gamma one, gamma one prime, gamma two, gamma two prime, but if you just got, write gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four, then the relations are like that. This is supposed to be a coronator delta function. Yeah, okay. This is precisely my point, because if you put i equal to j on the right-hand side, you get something final. On the left-hand side, you should have a product of two fermions in the same state. And but these are, this is, these are not exactly fermionic operator. These are my own. Anna. So suppose that you write, you take a fermion and you write it like gamma one plus I gamma two. We can do the math later on, but so it's not exactly the same thing. The, 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 the commutation, the, the anti commutation relation describing full fermions and my own fermions are slightly different. They are not exactly the same. So if this is the question, if you but want I later on, I can. Multiple occupation of the same state by my is allowed. Just, I'm sorry? So a multiple occupation of the same state by Majoranus is allowed. It's... Yeah. Yes? Okay. So you just, you just, the state, the thing is that when you have a Majorana fermion, you don't know what the state is. Okay? You don't have a Fox space defined for Majorana fermion. You just don't. So what you can do, you can cook up by a two Majorana, you can cook up a Fox state. By, you can cook up a fermion, and that fermion defines one state that can be empty or full. In fact, every time that you have Majorana fermions, you always have an even number of them because you start with fermions and you will end up with fermions. You just sort of rearrange, okay? It's just an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, of the Bugoliub of the Jain field Hamiltonian. So you cannot just really write 
uh, perhaps I should go, but you cannot just write a Fox state. There is no state associated to a Majorana Fermi. You can associate a state to Fermi. And, uh, but at the level of, uh, op uh, at the operatorial level, you definitely can. And then you can choose this representation, the Fox states of the Fermi, and then take matrix element and see what comes out. And that's going to be your matrix representation of your operator. As simple as that. Okay, so let's go on. So now I want to talk about enhanced coherence of uh, in superconduct enhancing the coherence of uh, in superconducting circuits by a band engineer. A, a quick slide is pretty late. So this is a graph that shows you, uh, how the coherence time lifetime of superconducting qubits have evolved in the last twenty years. Okay, you see that there was uh, I mean nowadays and twenty years ago I mean we are they achieved six orders of, of man, magnitude uh, of, uh, of the enhancement of these, queens, of these lifetimes. Nevertheless, if you really pay attention to this curve, you see that there was a big jump at the beginning, and then the curves kind of slows down, and in the last 10 years, all dots here, they get dense around 10 to the 3 microsecond, which is uh, at most one of the best things that I've read around about uh, coherence time is one millisecond or something like that. One millisecond is really good for, for a superconducting cube. And uh, why is that? So what are the noises, uh, the, the sources of noise that you may have in a superconducting qubit? Well, basically you have charge noise and flux noise, okay? So um, I think that the title here is noise insensitive quantum state. So, what does that mean? Suppose that you have an Hamiltonian that depends on some external parameters. External parameters are controlled. There are things that couple, in fact, to the environment, no? But, and this lambda can be the offset charge that I showed you before. You, you remember this offset charge in, on, the, on the superconducting cube, on the transmon qubit. And some external fluxes. You see there are a lot of fluxes that pierce. Every time there is a loop, there is a flux that pierces that loop, or that might be a fluctuating one. So you have put it external magnetic field to zero, but there's still some concatenated flux that goes through that loop and fluctuates. And so if you generally write down a, an Hamiltonian uh, consisted by an H0, that's what you want to have, and the external word that couples through your parameter lambda, then you immediately see that your energy levels they do depend on lambda in this way. Okay. Now, what you want to have, and probably we will see at the end of the, the talk quickly, is that you want to have this zero, as zero as possible. Okay. And so you basically want to flatten these. Okay. So you want to flatten the derivative, the band. Let, let's talk about band flattening. Okay. We just switch to a little, uh, um, a little, uh, Jargon, which in this audience is uh, much more uh, familiar than in other. And so now we have the spectrum uh, uh, depends, for example, on, uh, on the offset charges by this QG is what before was called NG. And it means that you have a sensitivity to charge noise because this derivative, if it is non-zero, then it will be sensitive to charge noise. Okay. And so the idea now is uh, uh, let's focus on charge noise and forget about flux noise. And uh, how can we get better performances with respect to, to charge noise? Well, we flatten the band, so we reduce this by a shunt capacitance. You remember that there was, at some point, I show you EC over EJ. When EC dominates, you have this parabola. So it means that you have a huge dependence of the offset charge, okay? But when EJ dominates, I mean, they are pretty flat. You don't see any dependence on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the charge, on the offset charge. This is achieved by a shunt capacitance the basic, because basically what you have is the charging energy is E squared divided by 2C, it's a, a, a capacitance. So it's like saying you have very big mass of your bands, okay? Um, this is what uh, has been done in the transmon, basically, okay? But what I wanted to try to do now here is to get that by band engineering. 
Okay, so suppose that you have a, a loop interrupted, a superconducting loop interrupted by n uses in junction. All right, so through flux quantization, you will have n minus one phase degrees of freedom and n minus one charge degrees of freedom on any ion that you form. Okay, the most general Hamiltonian that you can write of this object as a charging energy and the Josephson energy. The charging energy is just the quadratic form of the charges. Question? Well, uh, band flattening takes place in momentum space. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and lambda is some parameter which you somehow introduce from outside. Why should the derivative be zero in this? But because my lambda is QG now, and then if you know about momentum space, you call phi x equal QP, then it's going to get a band structure that which is exactly what I'm going to say now. So now lambda is an external parameter. I want to kill the derivative with respect to lambda of my energy levels in general. That's general, okay? Now I haven't, yeah, you're right. So I should have perhaps put this slide before that second part of the previous slide. But the idea is that, okay, because of this, U, phi is, uh, U of phi is just as an energy is, a, a peri is periodic in the phase. It's a periodic potential. So uh, there is a block theorem that tells you how wave functions are here. And that this QG, this Q plays the role of a momentum and this momentum derivative with respect to phi and this QG plays the role, the role of the quasi momentum that is conserved in a crystal and is defined on the brilliant zone. No? And so you, get, uh, you can imagine that this, the, the spectrum of this object we look like a band structure as a function of QG, the offset charges. Okay, so now the idea comes again. You can see that this is a kind of crystal quantum, crystal momentum, this is a offset charge. And then uh, the idea is, uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we want to flatten the bands in this kind of uh, way. So, uh, now, the energy dependence basically reflects the symmetries of the Josephson potential. So if we want to do something, since the charging energy is trivial, you just have capacitance, and that's it. So what you can do, you can tailor the Josephson potential, right? By doing that, we can engineer multiplets of flat bands. Flat bands exactly in this sense of condensed pattern physics, of uh, uh, band structure of crystals, right? And... Um, as you may know, there are two typical ways to do that. One is uh, a long, through long wavelength destructive interference. For example, that's what you get in the quantum mole effect, in the integer quantum mole effect, and then what you have in twisted bilayer graphene, right? And, uh, or you can also do it uh, through atomic-like redundancy. It means that what you have in a Lieb lattice, in a Kagan lattice, you have more atoms than conductivity, basically, of a, of a lattice. So immediately, immediately, if you see such tight binding models, a one-dimensional model, you immediately can be sure that there, are, there is going to be some states that do not respect, disperse as a function of the in-plane moment. And so the idea is try to do that by tailoring the Josephson potential. OK, so this is uh, back to superconducting qubits. These are two instances of a flux qubit. I talked about uh, a charge qubit or transmol, basically. Uh, and now I'm gonna talk about flux qubit. Now flux qubit, problems of flux qubit, this is the circuit, okay? So you have at least three junctions, and then you have a flux and you have offset charges. A flux qubit suffers both from charge and flux noise. Okay, so let us try to minimize, minimize the impact of, uh, of charge noise. Okay, once again, one of these three phases is locked by quantization of the flux. So this is the Josephson potential that you have if uh, you pierce this, uh, this loop with half flux quantum. Okay, so you have, these are maxima. This is the, your unit cell, if you wanna see it as a crystal, again, because the phase is periodic. And these are two minima, okay? And then, yeah, so the flux qubit, it, it means that I call these two minima 
quantum states. And then I switch on all the possible couplings or tunneling through minima, you can see it here. And then if you take, imagine to have a, a picture in which you extend this periodic potential that is defined only from zero to two pi to the infinite, so you decompactify the phase variable. What you have is an infinite lattice and we, in each unit cell, you have two states. And now these two states, these two levels disperse, you can write down a little bit, this is graphene. This is just, uh, this is just the, the honeycomb lattice. I mean, you don't really, but if you continue it, you have a, a honeycomb lattice basically. Uh, what's different is that the intra uh, inter unit cell tunneling is different. Okay, so in fact, that's what you have if you just call delta zero and delta one, the tunneling intracell and intercell. Okay, so that's where the dependence you see on these charges appears in the qubit Hamiltonian. So we want to minimize as much as possible this dependence. So there is a brute force way to do it. So we want to kill basically delta one. That's what we want to do. And how we do that? We can do it uh, by, okay, so now suppose that I replace all cos phi by cos two phi. Now the pi periodic Joseon junction that we saw, we talked about until now, basically. And then I ch change from two minima that I show you right now to eight minima, all right? And, uh, and, and then I add on top of that a cos phi. So I have this circuit, these objects, that this, this is just a little um, plot of these two, two wires uh, uh, realization that I showed you before. And these are just ordinary Josephson junction. And that, that's what you have now as a Josephson potential. Okay, you see, I mean, all these, the, the two minima that I had before has, has become eight because you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and these, and these are also two minima. But because I'm also adding a cos phi, I is like, I have a long wave and not too long too, <laughs> but a longer wave and modulation of the, of the landscape. So now if uh, the cos two phi terms dominate with respect to the cos phi terms, I can modulate a little bit this potential and, and make these two to be two absolute minima and all others to be relative minima, okay? Now my qubit is gonna be this and this, these two states sitting here. Where are the next? Well, I see the next is here or here. They're pretty far now, okay? And again, if before I was getting a, these are potential barriers that I can now control because in order to go from one to another one, let's say here, I have to go by a second order perturbation theory if you want. I have to do it as virtual processes. I cannot directly go to here to here. This would be the right, right. Right is because there is a circulating current in the loop, which is clockwise, let's say, and another one to the left, which, which is counterclockwise. So I do it this way. And what I see is that I can take into account virtual process. This is, and then I kill dramatically this delta one. Okay. And then, and then these are the, the energy levels. And these energy levels, you see the first three levels, they, they don't even show any dispersion on this scale. Of course, there is a little dispersion. We just don't see it. Okay. At this, at this scale. So I have reduced a lot that. Okay, this is not just, just simply interference. And what I've done, I have increased the redundancy uh, of the description of the, of the potential. I have been tailoring the just zone potential, basically. Sorry, Luca, but it's only because you added the cos phi also. Yes. You don't? Well, you're back, uh, you're back, uh, you have increased the, the degeneracy of your system. You have increased the degeneracy of your system because uh, you see uh, now, I mean, Phi is a compact variable. And then, so you have more minima with respect to, so you had eight min, you have now eight minima. Okay, right. so let me go back. Yeah, the, the question for the online audience was what happens if you don't add the cost of pi? Yeah, so now you see, now imagine that all these are like this, okay? The white square is still the correct um, uh, unit cell because uh, phase is defined between zero and two pi, not pi. So you see that now you have eight minima. So you have, uh, 
not qubit with two states, but you have eight states. And then two of the, each two of the, each pair will be degenerated. And then, uh, so then it depends. They, they will be splitting due to the tunneling by all these. But you have uh, the nice thing here is that you don't gain much if you don't have the cause phi. Now, the, the, the thing is that you want to have a long wavelength modulation of a short wavelength uh, original model. So with the cos to phi, I make a short wavelength original model. And then on top of that, I modulate the potential on a slightly longer scale. It's not really long, but... Okay, so, and uh, if I now plot the... You see, if I plot the energy difference between these two levels, okay, and is still dependent on the on the charges, but you should pay attention to basically the 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 the, the, the numbers. So it is normalized to the the, the difference of the, the the energy spacing. So you have ten to the minus five. Okay, so I've reduced this a lot. Okay, so basically, uh, what tells what this tells me is that my uh, superposition of zero and one state won't, which is omega that it evolves in times in this way, uh, doesn't fluctuate because omega one zero, which is basically this difference, it almost does not depend on the charges. You can neglect it. And so we achieve extremely long lifetimes, okay? As far as T phi is concerned, which is as far as the super, I'm talking about the superposition between zero and one. That's what in the literature, is called by T fine, pure decoherence time, no? Pure dephasing, sorry, pure dephasing time. T1 is basically the, 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 the probability to, to go from one to zero when you are in the excited state. Of course, this uh, is, you can, you can study both the, these uh, coherence time, but I just keeping that. I mean, the idea is that one. So, but another thing that I can do, which is pretty interesting is that I can go on and then I can play Take a slightly similar circuit. I place no flux through the loop. And so I have no circulating currents. And you see, I have some, some are ordinary Joseon junction, some are cos phi, cos two phi Joseon junction. So a cos phi has global minima actually at multiples of two pi. Again, I place a cos two phi as a local minima at multiples of pi by adding up. The two things, what I have is that instead of having the original minima here, now I have some, this is again the Josephson potential, some are absolute minima, some are relative minima. So I, through the cos to phi potential by modulating the, on top of the cos phi potential, the other way around, sorry, modulating the cos to phi potential with the cos phi potential, I can modulate this. And then now, I say, let's say I have a global minimum. I have two degenerate local minima here and here. And I have an higher energy local minimum that I throw away. So I have three states in this, uh, in this unit cell. And then uh, some, some of you may recognize Lib lattice. Okay, Lib lattice features a flat band in momentum space. So again, so if I take, I, I just, Forget that I'm talking about the superconducting circuit. I just take a Lib lattice and then call Q what, what was called K. And then I have the low energy Hamiltonian is just given by that in, the, in this approximation in which I just have tunneling to this adjacent minimum. So the minima are not degenerate? Yeah, no, they are not. So you're approximating? I am approximating, yeah. It's a good approximate. <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, the minima are not degenerate. And uh, in fact, uh, at the degeneracy point, what I have is exactly this. So of course, the, there is a little, these are not exactly degenerate. There is a kind of epsilon here, if you want, that I haven't put it here, but it's, uh, it's slightly small. So what you have is that you're, you're close. You're not exactly there. There are, you cannot kill completely, uh, uh, you ca cannot kill completely the tunnelings, so you don't have perfect degeneracy, but the idea is still there. So you can obtain something which is uh, uh, like a three-level system with, uh, in this case, you just have one flat band. 
Okay, in the previous case, I had in mind a precise task that was reducing the um, or increasing the coherence that they deface in time. This is just an example in which I can try to tailor the band structure a little bit, and then I can kind of mimic things that uh, uh, can be do exactly, let's say, in a, in a, in a crystal. And uh, I can show, and this is just what you find if you just calculate the coherence time. And with this, I, I just want to close everything and then flash these slides in which uh, we basically I show you that multiples of fat, flat bands provide uh, noise insensitive quantum states and that band engineering is a kind of a tool that can be used to increase coherence time. And uh, again, a harmonic Josephson junction can be used for engineering Josephson potential, get rid of charge noise uh, and, um, and cook up any kind of, uh, almost cook up any kind of, uh, uh, just some potential. And before I show you how to, to couple parity protected superconducting qubit to Majorana qubit. And all this is based on this pi periodic Jusson junction. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Luca, for this uh, fantastic talk. Really interesting. So let me ask uh, to the online audience first, if they have questions, you can raise your hand or I see there is already one question. Sigmund, maybe you can allow Walter to speak. Hello. Walter. Hello, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I have a question. How well can you actually uh, put the band engineering into practice as an experimentalist? Okay, so it depends how good you can build up a pi periodic Josephson junction, I would say. So this is just playing with some novel element. So suppose that you are able to do a very good pi periodic Josephson junction by the means that you most like or the one that is best suits to your experimental setup, and uh, and then you can just insert them in, uh, in, uh, in the circuits. So you have, it depends basically on what you can do on at the circuit level rather than what you can do at the theory level. And, and taking into account uh, possible uh, inaccuracy in making the spent uh, gap engineering, what would you expect to uh, attain in coherence time? Okay, so the thing is that the following is so, um as you see, I'm mixing cos phi and cos 2 phi in the second part of the talk. It, this means that I'm not really worried of pi periodic perturbations, right? So what I need is to have a good pi periodic component in the Josephson potential. That's very different from what you have in the parity protected superconducting qubit in which any two pi periodic element is detrimental. Here, I don't care if I have an additional two pi periodic perturbation. Actually, I'm exploiting both of them. So that's the great advantage that you have from this kind of, uh, of um, thinking of uh, designing the circuit. So what you need, for example, is always when you have superconducting qubits, you have three juices on junction and you would like to have two of them exactly equal. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. If you want two cos two phi exactly equal, it's going to be more difficult. But yeah, that's a technical uh, technical problem I see. okay thank you welcome okay thank you more questions in the online audience please raise your hand or write it in the chat uh, i think there are no more questions online so questions here pablo okay so thanks very much luca um did i get it correctly that for the bosonic parity conservation thing, all the proposals that you have in mind are uh, kind of fine-tuned. You fine-tune the symmetry between the two transmissions. You fine-tune phi zero over two for the flux. So any perturbation from the environment that breaks that symmetry is going to mix the two bosonic sectors, right? Yes. That you don't have any other architecture in mind that automatically 
uh, implements the bosonic parity, right? Yeah, you can have four E superconductors. But <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's what, uh, I mean, okay. actually there, are, there was, uh, in January, there was uh, a Kagom lattice superconductor that sh shows a phase 4E, but okay, it's, it's fantasy in the sense that at the present level, no. Okay. okay. So you have, because uh, the fundamental process is a single Cooper pair tunneling. So if you want to have two Cooper pair tunneling as the fundamental one, you have, there is a lot of fine tuning. That's right, right, right. Okay. More questions? So, um, sorry, because maybe uh, in the second part of your talk, uh, topology, top, topological junctions were involved. What do you mean, with my affirmance? Yes. No. No. No, no. no. So, in the, uh, so I, my question is like, in the two, let's say, parts of your talk, what is the role of the uh, magnetic field, meaning which magnetic fields do you need or, or in which directions? Uh, so okay. I'm... So when you have a loop, you need yes. an out of plane. An out of plane. Out of yes. plane magnetic field. Mm -hmm. When you have Majorana, you need, you need in plane. But there are things that, I mean, these perfect uh, Andre bound state mm -hmm. and presence of an out of plane magnetic field. It's, if it is small enough and so on. Yeah, the know? field is uh, neg neglected there, but mm -hmm. there is a not a precise one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. But at the present level, just to convey the idea, I mean, we just mm -hmm. neglect that. And, and in the second part of your talk, uh, as uh, this uh, setup that you showed, you'd at least need a minimum number of Josephson junctions, no, to to be able to cook up this. Um, yes. Uh, cosine dependencies that you need. So what you were showing us is the minimum number of, of elements that you can, yes. that you need. Yes, yes. So because, I start... yeah, just my question is, is at, at least at the level of today, is so difficult already to have one of these uh, parts working fine, for right. example, in the Magellana right. business, then when you start to put many together, I can imagine yes. that the complexity grows a lot. No, so yeah, yeah. of course, you're totally what, right. What are the minimal? Uh, uh, what is the minimal number of elements uh, in your circuit that you need to to be able to? Cook in my up case, this? I use what I think is the minimum one. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can further reduce. Yes. But basically, what you have is that in these cases you have always two independent phases. Mm -hmm. That's so at really least I think you need at least two. But you can also play with just one. And then kind of, of course, if you play what, with one, you're going to have one direction, one linear combination of phi one and phi two that would be affected and the orthogonal one perhaps not. I don't know, or you have, we will have some skew directions, but you cannot perfectly control everything. So you have a two-dimensional potential in the plane, so uh, phi one and phi two. And then so if you want to have full control, I guess, the best thing is to have two Jesus injunctions, mm -hmm. phi periodic one. Okay. And in this second part, you only needed a perpendicular magnetic fields, no, no other components. No? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Elsa. Some more questions? One more? No, we are yeah. <laughs> Just a quick one related to Elsa's question. Uh, uh, what about an, an SSH implementation? SSH is one dimension. Yes. So instead of a Lib lattice, to have an SSH lattice, is that possible with one junction? Uh, and would it be interesting? See, let me see. Yeah, I've thought about that. Uh, so you should have a, a, a potential. OK, so there is two things that you can do. There's one thing that you can do, one other thing that you cannot do with these circuits. So you can, you can tailor the Joseon potential. So instead of having a cosine, you need cos two phi and a cos phi, and then you have the two of them. And then you definitely have this. And there are proposals like that. And so you will have the, the two of them that have a, a little uh, barrier to it, and the other two that have a, a larger barrier to it. So you just have T1, T2, T1, T2. Uh, the things that you don't have, boundary. exactly. You don't have a boundary here. So you can actually have a boundary. I can, we talk, can talk about, so if you, it, there is a way to decompactify the phase, which is the basis of the fluxonium qubit. Flaxonium. So you, you need a superinductor. You need an inductance. An inductance is a function of like phi square, right? So if, if you have a phi square, 
Uh, so if, if you have a cos phi, it's infinite, but uh, it's just on the compact space. But if on top of that, you just shunt it with an inductance, then you have two states, and then you have like a, a Joseon potential that grows, okay? But no, no hard boundary. No hard boundary. But I even tell you more, there is no Fermi level. These are bosons. So you can have a single particle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, you're going to find a bosonic SSH model, kind of. And uh, so what? So yeah, so what? Yeah, yeah. This is what you can do. What you cannot do is to go in the charge basis and to say that if I have even charges or odd charges, I have an energy imbalance. That's non-physical, I guess. Okay. So I think it's already a bit late, so I think we can finish now. And thank Luca again for the nice talk. Thank you, Thanks Luca. Thanks to you, Ramon. Thanks to everybody.